Hey, thanks for joining our online experience. We'd love to hear how God is moving in your life. You can email us at amen at revyourlife.com. If you'd like to support this ministry financially, it's as simple as a click. Just go to revgive.com. Thank you for joining us today. We hope to see you in person soon and enjoy today's message. Welcome to our new series. If you didn't notice, we're getting a a little political, but before you freak out about that, because some people do, okay, um, I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, I'm leaving my agenda at home. Now turn to your other neighbor, your second choice neighbor, and actually mean it this time. Okay, tell them, I'm leaving my agenda at home. All right, very good, very good. I'm curious, what do you love most about America? Shout something out. Anybody? Barbecue? Barbecue? What? Barbecue? Football? What else? Bacon? Somebody over Freedom, thank you. Somebody said something serious. Freedom. Bacon, football. (laughs) Baseball? That's more American, I think. I don't know. Anybody else? Somebody over here. One of you young guys. Huh? Texas, that's what I like about America, too. Somebody had to say that. So I would actually submit to you that the thing you actually love most about America, though you've not thought about it in a while, and you'd probably never shout that out to the preacher, and you probably haven't even prayed about this recently, though maybe we should pray about this all the time and thank God for it, is this, the Bill of Rights. Because most countries don't have anything like this. And the Bill of Rights, if you don't know what it is, it is the the name given to those very first 10 amendments to the Constitution that guarantee you and I our personal rights and our freedoms. And maybe you haven't thought about the Bill of Rights lately. Uh, I had to do a little brushing up this week too, okay, so don't feel guilty. But let's put them up here on the screen and talk about them. Free speech, that's amazing. Because free speech says, I can say whatever I want about you and you can say whatever you want about me and I can say bad things about your mama on your Facebook and isn't it just great to be an American, right? Assembly, this is so important because we literally could not do what we're doing right here, right now if we did not have the freedom to assemble, right? There are countries where if you want to have church, you have to register with the government and they might actually say, no, we got enough churches, we're not going to let you do that. And, And a lot of Americans have just never left the country and experienced anything like that. So we take it for granted, but this is so, so important. And then the right to bear arms. It's summertime. Don't you love the right to bear arms? Now, I spelled it wrong on purpose, okay? But watch when I fix the spelling. It actually gets even weirder. Bear arms. Sorry, really bad preacher jokes. We all know what that one's actually about. Due process, jury trial. Now, how many of you have actually said, thank you so much, God, when you get a jury summons in the mail? Probably none of us. Most of us are like, God, how do I get out of this? Show me the way, right? But hey, maybe... As Americans, we ought to thank God for that opportunity to serve on a jury. Search and seizure, cruel and unusual punishment, and then this last one, this is just the best one, isn't it? Aren't you glad we don't have to quarter soldiers anymore? I mean, that's so important, isn't it? No, what that last one shows us is that um, the forefathers actually knew that that the Bill of Rights might have to kind of change and mold over time, right? So they did something really, really amazing. They were just so smart. They added the Ninth Amendment, and the Ninth Amendment says this, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people, meaning, you know, there's some other personal rights too. What we've written here is just some of them. It's not all of them. Now, um, here's what we would say the Bill of Rights should be today, maybe. I think it'd look a little different, don't you? I think we'd say things like, um, every American has the right to free Wi-Fi, <laughs> right? Like, that's something we might actually put in there, right? Or um, let's get a little more serious. Maybe you'd say, and, and we're not going to get political. We're leaving our agenda at the door, remember? But maybe you would say the right to free college education. Or maybe you would say uh, the right to free health care. It would, it would look a little different if we wrote it today, wouldn't it? We would have some different ideas. But I think if we wrote the Ninth Amendment, it would read something kind of like this. Here's the modern day Ninth Amendment. I have the right to do what I want, when I want, with whom I want, as long as it doesn't interfere with anyone else's Ninth Amendment rights. Because we think that way as Americans, don't we? 
Isn't that true that that's how we think? Well, pff, I'm American. I'll do what I want with who I want, when I want. I'll spend my money how I want, and I don't really care or think too much about what it might do to somebody else. Now, there's a major problem with that. How many parents are in the room? Okay, every single parent knows this. If you're not a parent, you may not have thought about this yet, but just hang with us here. Parents understand it intuitively. If you give somebody a whole bunch of personal rights, but there are no personal responsibilities coupled and paired up with those personal rights, it goes terribly wrong really fast, doesn't it? How many of you had a curfew growing up? And your curfew was 11, right? And so if dad said curfew's 11, you have the right to go out. We are giving you the right to go hang out with your friends, but you have the responsibility along with that right to be home by 11, and you got home at 11.04, what happened? My dad was waiting for me at the door. I don't know about your parents. Maybe they were asleep or something. But my dad was waiting for me at the door like this, tapping his foot. And if I walked in and saw that, I was like, oh, because I knew it was coming. And so my dad would say, hey, you had the right to be out with your friends till 11, but since you did not own up to your responsibility to be home by 11, your right to be out by, uh, till 11 has been pushed back to nine, Right? Or, hey, you don't get to go out at all. Anybody have that experience? Why? Because you did not keep your personal responsibility, so you lost your individual right. Individual rights must be paired with personal responsibility. It has to be that way, or it doesn't work. Now, in my wife's family growing up, apparently they did this. I never experienced this. I've always thought it's kind of weird. I'm curious if there's anyone else in the room. How many of you had your door taken away when you were a teenager? Yeah, see, there's just a few, because isn't that kind of weird? Like, you slam your door, so I just take it. I don't understand that. Like, I do understand uh, I lock you in your room <laughs> and confine you. That's awesome. But take your door away. I guess it works for some people. But what we're learning here is that liberty without responsibility actually undermines liberty, doesn't it? Liberty without responsibility will actually destroy liberty. When there's liberty and no responsibility, liberty will eventually devour itself. Which leaves me with a question. We got the Bill of Rights. I started wondering as I was preparing this week, how come we don't have a Bill of Responsibility? And so I started looking into this and thinking about it, and, and I realized why. Um, the reason we don't have a Bill of Responsibility, though we do have a Bill of Rights, is because the guys who wrote the Constitution and the Founding Fathers, there is so much literature. They wrote so much, okay? So in the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, but also in their personal journals that we've been able to read through and some of their letters back to home, I mean, there is just a wealth of information. They wrote a ton. But every time they wrote, they always assumed some moral guardrails were in place, just kind of generally in society. And those moral guardrails pretty much covered this need for personal responsibility. They just thought everybody kind of has these. And it made sense back then because they just come through the Revolutionary War. There was this deep sense of liberty and just personal responsibility. There was this deep sense of things that we don't really do anymore, this, this synergy around a moral co code, simple things like, you know, uh, I take care of my neighbors. And so for them, individual expression was really governed and tied to a concern for other individuals. They actually thought, instead of, well, it's my right. They actually thought, well, it's my right, but how will it affect our schools? How will it affect our community? How will it affect my neighbor and my family? They knew my individual rights are not just about me. Now, the best example in American literature of this idea of personal responsibility and even divine accountability is found in the preamble to the Declaration of Independence. It says this, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. See, they just had this idea, this thinking, that it's self-evident. It's kind of written on our hearts, right? And we're not going to ignore it. And that our rights aren't given to us by a government or a bunch of laws. Our rights are actually given to us by the divine. Now, they didn't think everybody had to be a Christian, okay? Leave your agenda at the door. I'm not saying that. Clearly, though, I'm a pastor. I would prefer that, no doubt. If you're a Christian, you probably would too, okay? 
But that's not even what we're saying has to happen. And that's not even what they were saying. They were simply saying that we're accountable to the divine for how we live our life and how we exercise these rights and this liberty that we have been given. Now, President John Adams, our second president, uh, apparently he never owned a slave, a very unique guy in our American history. He wrote this. He said, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. In other words, if there's no consensus around this idea that there has got to be some sort of divine accountability, some sort of higher power with this moral authority that has written it on our our, our hearts that we are ultimately accountable to, then you know what? This whole entire thing uh, called America, this experiment that we're doing in in religious liberty and freedom and right, it's all going to fail. If there's no moral and religious aspect to it, it will fail. If you just give individual rights, but no responsibility, this whole thing is going to devour itself. Doesn't that kind of sound like where we are today? Because what you have in this system is a whole bunch of people with rights, only worried about their rights. And what are the rights doing? They're colliding, are they not? And when the rights collide, the courts decide, right? Isn't this how we are? Our rights collide, and then we go, well, I'm going to get a lawyer. I'm going to get two lawyers. I'm going to get a female lawyer. Whoa. Right? They're extra mean, okay? I said I wasn't going to say that again, but I said it again. I'm sorry. And the problem is that was not the intent of the founding fathers. Because with this is our system for living, and with this is our central belief about government and who we are as a a nation and where we need to go and all that, what you end up with is just the need to create law after law after law for every potential outcome and possibility in life. And how are you ever going to win or set up a society that doesn't fall to pieces with that? And and what we do, it's even worse, because as Americans, what do we do? Every time there's a law written, we look for a loophole, right? Well, that's not how I read that law. Well, that law doesn't apply to me because I'm not this. Oh, you can't penalize me because that's not how me and my lawyer see it. So I'm glad we have laws. Laws are great. There's nothing wrong with laws. We need laws. But there's a problem with laws. The problem is that the law only represents the minimum requirement in life. The law only answers this question. How low can I go? Isn't that true? That's all the law tells us. How, how low can I go? How flexible is the line? How close can I get to the line? Maybe step a tiny bit over the line and still be okay. How much can I push, 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 right? And we do this all the time, don't we? I mean, let's just talk about driving. The speed limit is 60, so what do we do? We're Americans. We go, it's 60. Can I go 64 without getting pulled over? Can I go 66 without getting pulled over? Can I go 67 without getting pulled over? Can I go 67 and get pulled over but not get a ticket, just get a warning? Can I go 67 and get pulled over and get a warning but not go to jail? How fast do I have to go to go to jail? 80 in a 60? I'll go 79 in the 60. (laughs) This is what we do, isn't it? Come on, don't look at me like you obey the speed limit all the time, all right? I'm the preacher and I don't always obey it, so I know you don't, all right. So how flexible is it? See, that's the problem with the law. It just tells us how low can we go? How much can we abuse this? The law can't do what actually matters most in life. The law is powerless to do the most important thing. The law is powerless to inspire greatness, excellence, or virtue in our lives. It just tells us, man, how low can I go? It just kind of gets us asking that question. Now see, ultimately, The job of the law is not to do this anyway, is it? That's not what it's supposed to do anyway. And it's powerless to do it. So here's the result. And this is a bad result. may not seem like it at first glance. But we have individual rights regulated by laws. Big whoop. And you might look at that at first glance and go, so what's wrong with that? I'll show you what's wrong with that. If you have a culture where the results are just individual rights regulated by laws, here's what you end up with in your culture. The rich will always rule the poor. Women are always a commodity. Children will be victims. If it's legal, it's moral. I mean, come on, it's legal. So what's wrong with it? Law informs the conscience instead of that divine authority. And everybody's always looking for a loophole. Now, that's a pretty sad culture to live in. I think we would all agree. 
And here's the killer part about that. I'm convinced, like many of you are probably convinced. And, and listen, um, when I say this, I hope I'm wrong, and I hope you're wrong, but we're probably not wrong. I would say our legal system is permanently detached from that sense of divine accountability and divine moral authority. The train has left, it's not coming back. I'm convinced, there's, there's not a fix for that. And all this is is a recipe for you and I to be as selfish as we can possibly be if it's just always about the loss. So that's the end of my talk and I'll see you guys next week. Thank you, y'all are. No, we can do better than this, right? We can do better than this. And while it might be true that we are very separated as a nation from this sense of divine morality and accountability, um, I would tell you this. There is hope. The hope is you and I, God's church, God's family, Christians. You and I are the hope of the world, Jesus said. <laughs> Did you know that it's estimated 65% of Americans still consider themselves to be some kind of Christian? I had a hard time even believing that statistic, but, but it's true. It's the statistic, the most recent one that we have. And I think that tells us that our conduct as Christians has more potential to bring about more change than any law or anybody that we elect this season. Because all that law can do is define how low can you go. And all the politicians are really supposed to do is enforce that law. I'd say the only hope for us as a nation the only thing that's going to take us back, probably not all the way, but to a much better place, is you and I doing what you and I are called to do. And here's how I know this. It's not my opinion. I read it in the Bible. God challenged us on this. So 2,000 years ago about a guy named Paul, the Apostle Paul, you'll probably at least heard of him. Uh, he, he's responsible for writing about half, a little more than half of the New Testament. And usually what he's doing is he's actually just writing letters to different churches that he had helped start. And he's helping them work through issues. So one time he's writing a letter to the church in Galatia. That's the book in the New Testament called Galatians. And what he says is, hey, um, you guys are Gentiles. And a Gentile would have been a Christian who is not Jewish first. In other words, probably most of us, right? And he's saying, you've got some confusion as Gentiles, because what they were doing was some of the Jewish Christians were telling them, well, we have to follow these 600 and whatever Old Testament laws, and so since we have to, you guys probably need to kind of go back and be Jewish first and follow all those laws, like get circumcised and stuff, and those Gentile guys are going, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, nobody said I had to do that, right? And he's, come on, that was funny, y'all, and he said, too far, all right, so so he says, no, now that you're Christians, you have a brand new way of living. And you have a brand new way of, of pursuing those freedoms. And you've got a brand new way of responding to the love of Christ, right? Because what we always tend to do is naturally use those freedoms for personal gain. Like when you very first got your license and dad handed you the keys and he said, okay, go for your very first drive all by yourself. What did you do? If you're like me, you got in the car and you started it and you looked at the speedometer and you were like, it goes to 150. I wonder. I wonder, right? Because that's what we tend to do, right? So Paul says, no, 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 wait a minute. You can do better. And how you respond to your freedoms as Christians is the game changer for you, for the kingdom of God, but also for the world around you, also for your country, also for your community. And he makes this statement so relevant for us today, he kind of looks into the future and he gives us this direction. Galatians 5.13, he says this. It says, you, my brothers and sisters, you were called to be free. And we all love that. But then he says, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. In other words, stop asking, where's the line? How far can I go? How low can I go? Is there a law against it? Because that's the wrong question that you need to ask. And this is so powerful. Imagine if every single Christian did this, even just for one day, how the world can change. Serve one another humbly in love, he said. No law, no government official can make you do that, right? It is a choice. And God has called us as Christians to do this, to serve one another humbly in love, to use our freedom to serve others. You've got the right not to, but you have the opportunity to. And what a great opportunity. And then Paul quotes something from Leviticus, from the Old Testament. It's also something that Jesus said, really the entire theme of Christianity, verse 14. 
He says, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. If you just do this one thing, love your neighbor as yourself. So my question for you is, what if instead of getting up and going, I'm free, I'm going to spend my money on what I want and do what I want and live how I want. What if we woke up and said, I'm free, how can I serve others today, God? How can I love you and love people best today, God? What if we woke up and said as husbands, how can I serve my wife today, God? What if we woke up as students, right, and said, how can I love and serve and treat my teachers and professors? Maybe I need to treat them and love them and serve them like I want them to treat me. Teenagers, what if you woke up and said, how can I treat my parents today, God? God, I I hope that my kids will treat me a certain way when I'm a parent. God, help me to treat my parents that way today. Employees, what if you said, I'm going to treat my boss how I hope the employees treat me one day when I'm the boss, right? Imagine just one single day where everyone that's a Christian in America did that. You know what would happen? If everybody did that, Here's how many laws we would need, right? I mean, there'd need to be some, but almost zero laws would be necessary. Why? Because instead of how low can I go, how can I get, 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 how can I take in this selfish mentality, we'd be looking up and saying, how good can I be? How can I love others? How can I serve others best, God? And you go, Zach, that's ridiculous, that's silly, and that'll never work. No, if you're a Christian, that's Christianity 101, the basics of following Jesus, It's as basic as it gets. Paul doesn't stop there, though. He gives us this warning. He says, if you don't do this, if you don't get this right, here's what's going to happen. Verse 15. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you'll be destroyed by each other. He's saying if you forget or fail to leverage your personal rights for the sake of everybody else, here's what it'll look like. A bunch of dogs biting and devouring each other. When it's all about you, you will destroy you. And today in America, we're all freaked out and worried about terrorism, right? That's our number one concern. The people on the outside coming in, the people that hate us on the outside coming in and hurting us. And I get that concern, but listen, there's a much greater thing we ought to be concerned about today because the greatest threat to America is not terrorists, it's us. It's Americans. We are the greatest threat to ourselves. We're our own greatest threat. It's not the stuff on the outside. You say, why is that? Because when we undermine our own liberty by focusing on ourself, our liberty that we're so passionate about, that we're so grateful for, will devour itself. It absolutely devour itself. We got more rights than any nation ever in human history, don't we? I mean, I'd say we live in the greatest country ever. But apart from a moral compass, that great country we love so much, it'll be destroyed by us. And I believe the scripture tells us only the church can change that. Not by being a unified voting block. I don't care who you're voting for. But by being a unified obedience block. By being unified around the scriptures and obedient as God has called us to, passionate about focusing on loving God and loving people and making a difference, not a point. So I have some applications for you because I hope you'll leave and actually get started on this. And some of it's going to sound basic, but it's stuff that we just don't think about and we just don't do enough. Number one, write these down. Do what's just, not what I can justify. Stop asking, how low can I go? Where's the line? Instead, ask, how high can I reach and how can I help? You want to shock your coworkers? Walk into work tomorrow and say, hey, everybody, I'm here to help. How can I help? And they'll go, excuse me? What'd you say? Because they haven't heard that, right? How can I help? I'm here to help. I mean, husbands, go home today. Make sure your wife's sitting down first. Honey, how can I help? (laughs) Teenagers? Mom, dad, how can I help? Because this is what God did. If you're going, well, why would I do that? If you're a Christian, it's what God did for you. He looked down on a sin-focused, sin-saturated world, and he said, how can I help? I've got to help. This was not my plan. What what am I going to do? How can I help? Oh, there's only one thing I can do. I'm going to have to serve these people humbly in love and send my only son to die for them on a cross. And then he did it. Second, do what's responsible, not what's permissible. 
Stop thinking, what can I get by with? And start thinking, what is my responsibility? And check this out. If you're not willing to take full responsibility for every potential outcome of any decision, any word you say, any step you take, then don't take that step. Say those words. Make that decision. Because sometimes you'll be the one that um, pays the consequences for that irresponsible decision that you made, but, but a lot of times somebody else will pay for your irresponsible decision. Amen? This is why we're still dealing with the national debt generations later, and we're just talking about it and talking nothing's being done. It's because for so many generations, we've been irresponsible with the national debt. And so now future generations, our generation, is paying for the responsibility that uh, past generations did not step up to the plate with. Quit having this, let's just get attorney's mentality and own it. Let's all say this together. Well, you haven't said this in forever, I bet. That's my responsibility. Wow, y'all said it without me even making you. All right, that was really good. Number three, do what's moral, not what's modeled. Do what's moral, not what's modeled. Stop taking your cues on morality from everybody around you and what you think's okay on the news because we're all already paying dearly for this mentality that says, and it's a, it, it is a pipe dream, it is not reality, y'all. This mentality that says, I can do what I want with whoever I want, wherever I want, as long as it's not like illegal, doesn't hurt anybody else. There's no consequences. No, that's a lie. There are consequences. There are absolutely consequences. It costs us. It will cost you, your family, your friends, your church, your community, and ultimately our liberty. Now, I want to say right here, if you're not a Christian, I'm not telling you that you have to live with Christian values. I'm just telling you to be the model, right? Best that you know how. But if you are a Christian, I'm telling you straight up, God has clearly called us to live a certain way. All of the answers are right here, and we have got to live how he has called us to live. And when we do, part of his promise is that we're better as people, but also our nation is better. His anointing bleeds out of our lives onto everybody around us. So you might be going, I'm the only Christian in my family. I just don't know what to do. You need to live the way God's called you to live, and I'm telling you, he's going to do something miraculously and great in your family through you. But it starts with us as Christ followers. We're to be the models, not to always model after others. And last, honor God. Let's honor God. Every time we make a decision or take an action, let's ask ourselves, will this honor God? And here's the thing about that question. You know it intuitively, don't you? You know the answer intuitively. You might choose to ignore it, but God's put something inside of every one of us where we know the answer to that question. We know this truth to be self-evident, don't we? We know it. He's written it on our hearts. It points us back to the fact that the Bill of Rights assumes accountability to God. And church, I'm telling you, we can do this. And imagine if all Christians did this. I mean, even like for just a week, just a day, right? What would happen? There's so much noise out there right now, especially in this kind of season that we're in as a nation leading up to the election. You know what would happen? We'd rise up to the top and push through all of that noise, and our message would be heard loud and clear. And God has called us, his kids, to do better, to love our neighbor as ourself, to do unto others as your heavenly Father through Christ has done unto you, to love God, to love people to leverage our individual rights for the sake of others so that our liberty is not destroyed. I read another quote from President John Adams this week, and it hit me really hard. I mean, it convicted me as if I was reading the Bible. He said this. He said, posterity, that means future generations. You will never know how much it cost the present generations to preserve your freedom It says, you might learn about it in history class or read about it or see a movie about it, but you're not going to feel it. You're not going to smell it. You're never going to know what it cost us. I hope you'll make good use of it. And here's the part that just killed me. If you do not, I shall repent in heaven that I ever took half the pains to preserve it. That hit me hard. And it gave me an idea. I woke up the next day after I read that quote singing a little song. I was singing red and yellow, black and white. They're all precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Republican, Democrat, left or right. They're all, right? Do you know why you're a Republican anyway, if you are? It's because of how you grew up, values that you've held for a long time. It's because of the information that you do have and do not have, right? Do you know why you're a Democrat? 
Same reasons. It's because of how you grew up, what resonates with your heart, information you do have and don't have, right? Do you know why you're a libertarian? Because you can't make up your mind. Sorry, I just thought we needed to lighten the mood a little bit. The point is we all have a unique view of freedom, okay? The question isn't, hey, what's your view? Now go fight for your view. The question is, what are you going to do with the freedom and the liberty and the rights that we so clearly have? Are you going to use them to serve one another humbly in love and honor God? Or are you going to squander them away? and be a part of liberty devouring itself. I'm telling you, no matter what you think that freedom is, it hinges on the divine. However you define that, there is a clear, absolute connection there to some sense of moral authority and divine accountability. And when you decide to turn your back on all of that, we get destroyed really quick. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? We're never going back to a time clearly where everybody's a Christian. I'm not even saying that that's what needs to happen. I'm saying that those of us who are Christians need to step up. It is time for us to step up to the basic command of Jesus to love our neighbor as ourself and to honor God, right? To wake up every day asking, how can I steward my individual rights and leverage my freedom to serve one another humbly in love? And why would I do that? Hey, because as a Christian, that's what God did for me. He sent his son. His son had to give up his right, become man, and die for me. Let's make good use, church, of what's been given to us. And so I wanna pray for every Christian in the room like this. God, all of us who would call ourselves Christ followers, I pray that you would help us step up to the plate in this area. I do pray for our nation too. I think that's extremely important. I pray for all of our leaders. The Bible tells us that you've put every one of them into place. Sometimes it doesn't make sense to us, but since you said that, I trust you, God, that you're still good and you're still doing something and you've got a purpose. The bigger question I wanna ask is what is my part? What role do I play? And so I'll pray, God, but help me to serve others humbly in love. And thank you that you did that for me. If you're not a Christian, I just want you to know that this is exactly what Jesus did for you. While you were still a sinner, while you were at your very worst, the Bible says, Christ died for you anyway. He hung on a cross anyway. He was put in a grave anyway. But then on the third day, he rose again and he conquered death. Literally, the worst thing that could happen to you, he obliterated it, he took care of it forever. He put it in the grave. On the cross, he said that the work was finished. So now there's no work that you have to do to get to heaven. You simply have to have a moment of faith where you identify yourself with what he did for you, where you accept it, where you say, I believe that by faith. Here's the beauty of that. doesn't mean you have to have every answer to every question you've got. It's a choice that you get to make. There is no reason you shouldn't make that choice to follow Jesus Christ today. There's no question too big for God. There's no thing in your life that's driven you too far away from him. He is so ready for you to come home running. Back to him, back to his loving arms. His arms are wide open. That's the posture of our church. We hope you felt welcome today. But most of all, we hope you give your life to Jesus Christ. If you want to take that step and do that, it happens just between you and God. It's a very personal moment. But I want to help you mark the moment by praying a simple prayer. So just in your heart right now, if this is you, just just pray like this. If this resonates with you, just say, Jesus, I give you my life. In the middle of my uncertainty, in the middle of my questions, I identify myself with the fact that you laid down your right for me. You died on a cross for me. You conquered death for me. I now call you Lord and Savior, and I commit to live the rest of my life with you. Would you teach me what it means to be a fully devoted follower? of Jesus Christ. Would you change me? Would you help me? Would you give me hope, peace, and joy? Help me to live that abundant life that you have called me to live. And thank you that I get to live forever with you in eternity, that the sting of death is gone in my life. Here I am. Please make me a brand new person. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, would you stand to your feet? Let's give it up for anybody who took that step today.